All right, everyone can hear me? Maybe. Yes. Okay. Hi, I'm Tony, uh, and I'm going to teach you all a completely worthless skill tonight. Yeah. Yes. So what are we going to do? We're going to compile Ruby from source code and stash it into an operating system package and install it on said operating system. Uh, particularly for me, this is for um, CentOS 7, which is the most uh, comfortable server software I'm used to. Uh, so this technically doesn't apply to the most widely used server out there, which is Ubuntu, unfortunately. But I hear the process is similar-ish building Debian packages, although some people say otherwise, uh, mainly just because they're biased against it. But we're going to build a package, and we're going to install it onto a CentOS box as the System Ruby. System Ruby is effectively similar to uh, OSX, where Ruby is installed by default, pretty much. Um, but in this case, we have full control over what version we're actually installing. And then we're going to actually verify that stuff actually works. So why? Well, there's no real big reason to, but um, for me, I personally don't prefer running RVM, RVM, or C Ruby on production. I think they're great development tools, allowing you to test libraries against many different versions of Ruby. But once you hit production, at least my opinion is you stick with one version, and you might as well just let the operating system handle it as opposed to very scripts and tricks and hope your RBM install is configured properly, um, is properly updated, uh, stuff like that. It's just one less layer of complexity that you have to deal with. It's just Ruby on the server. And also, you, this is a nicer way if you want to build specialized doc, Docker images for your team or you're uh, heavy in chef land and you need to automate a bunch of servers. Sometimes dealing with a simple package, you just SFTP up, run a script to install and call it a day as opposed to using to trying to find pre-built scripts to glue RVM or whatever you, what have you together, pretty much. Also, another good reason is because you can. Why not? So how are we going to do this? So we're going to have a virtual machine that is going to be the same um, operating system as production, in this case, CentOS 7. And this is probably the most important part of this. With Linux packages, if it's built for one version of the distro, it will only work on that version. So CentOS 7 packages won't work on CentOS 6, for example. So this has to be matched up. And preferably, all your patches are installed for that. And we're going to do all of this as a non-root user, but has pseudo access, because we do need some administrative uh, abilities for this. We're going to install build tools onto the VM. And we're going to prep a build environment. Uh, that involves actually downloading the Ruby source code from rubylang.org, as well as a configuration file, which we'll go into a bit detail later, that actually tells the operating system how to compile Ruby and stash it into a package. We want to build the package and then install the package to make sure it actually works. So the first thing you need on the operating system is stuff to actually build the damn Ruby. Uh, CentOS has a nice little group called Development Tools. This is equivalent to the Ubuntu Build Essentials package, where you get pretty much everything you need to compile anything under the sun for at least 90% of your use cases. You get your GCC, you get patching, you get wget, sometimes you get git depending on the operating system. With um, CentOS and Red Hat, you get a couple nice little extra packages called RPM Build as well as the Red Hat RPM config, which helps, which are basically utility classes that actually will let you build uh, RPM packages. Once we do that, uh, we're just going to make a couple, few quick directories in our home directory. Um, we have a directory called RPM build. This is where all of our stuff lives as far as building packages. Uh, the first command basically says home directory in RPM build directory, Make a build directory, build root directory, RPMs directory, sources directory, specs directory, and SRPMs directory. And we're going to go into more detail three of the five, uh, six rather, uh, in a little bit because they're the ones that we actually care about. And also we're going to stamp out a quickie configuration file to tell the operating system, hey, everything involving building RPMs is in our home directory inside of RPM build. So with those directories, the main things we are concerned about is sources, specs, and the RPMs directory. 
sources will hold your actual source code. This is the thing that will actually compile and be shoved into the package. What's nice about the setup is that you can be configured to build many different types of packages at once because all of your sources are effectively zipped up and organized in your sources directory. Your specs directory include uh, effectively meta, um, meta info files that actually tell the operating system how to build the package. And finally, the RPMs directory, and that is basically the output. We run a command, stuff builds, hopefully, and then the end result is a single file that spits out to the RPMS directory. So step one is we actually need the Ruby source code. That's relatively simple. We switch to the sources directory, and we'll just use wget to just literally pull down the source code from rubyland.org. Download the version you want. Uh, what's nice about Ruby is that pretty much it's relatively easy to get the version you want. You just substitute the last part of the file name to the actual version of Ruby you want. They don't haven't changed it in years, which is nice. And then we get a spec file. Um, in Ubuntu land, people commonly say, oh, I need a specific version of software or I need something that Ubuntu doesn't provide by default, you find a PPA. Well, in CentOS land, commonly that doesn't exist. What a lot of people do is share spec files, allowing you to build the package yourself. Um, the benefit about this is that you can, it allows you to customize your install effectively however you want. Once we get a spec file, we run RPM build, a couple flags, and it spits out to the RPM directory. Simple enough. How about a live demo? <laughs> so I have a virtual box with CentOS pre-installed, and we will turn. And is that big enough for everybody? Right. And then I have a oops, MSH. I have a shortcut. The virtual box is set up to run um, uh, OpenSSH. So really, you're going to do this to me now? There we go. And so I am just to prove it. I have SSH to a box. This is no longer uh, Kansas anymore. We're, in, we're inside an actual Linux box because that sure as hell doesn't look like any macOS directory that I've ever seen. So I went ahead and got all the pre, uh, required packages, the build tools. We have an RPM build directory. Here's all of our uh, files that we talked about. Inside of sources, we have our sources. We have our uh, Ruby source code. And I grabbed a spec file from the internet that I use pretty much use pretty often. It's from one of the actual um, one of the Ruby core members, he kind of runs his own uh, version of RPM for his um, actual day job. So let's see where all the magic actually looks like. Look at this, this would scare pretty much anybody, but it is relatively simple once you figure out what everything is. It's basically a glorified, I would say I and I file or not JSON-ish, but like a key value type of file. Uh, this is the syntax that uh, Red Hat uses to define what a package actually is. So we're going to have a variable just called Ruby ver that we can in, um, string interpolate anywhere we want. Our package name is Ruby. This is the version number. Uh, this is Red Hat isms as far as the release version of this particular package. We have a license, the URL where the source code come from, the actual uh, root directory where the compiling will happen. This will effectively map to the uh, build home directory um, inside of the RPM build directory. It eventually maps to it. We list the packages that the uh, R package will need on install. So um, Yum, the package manager of CentOS, will refuse to install Ruby unless these uh, prerequisites are installed. And we have the build dependencies, and so we cannot compile Ruby unless these packages are installed on our local system. Uh, we just uh, we mentioned where the source code is from. We can mention more than one source to, uh, directory to bring it all together. Uh, summary, organization, what binaries this provides. So we actually get, <coughs> excuse me, 
Ruby, IRB, the RDoC command, the Ruby gems command, and when comparing against any pre-existing installs of these binaries, we say that we obsolete the Ruby um, binary if our package is less than the existing one installed on the system. Description, quick prep work, and this is where the magic actually happens. This is what you do to actually compile Ruby. Um, this, these commands effectively can happen anywhere um, as far as you don't need to be inside of a build system to do it. You can mostly go through and execute these one at a time um, yourself. Probably want to fill in the uh, variable names with what you actually want, but this is how Ruby is effectively built. Here's a couple of configure uh, flags, and this is part of the benefit of only dealing with spec files because now we can compile our version of Ruby with whatever we want. We can say, so in this case, by default, we don't want X11 bindings. Um, I've seen some where we um, say we don't want the QT bindings or the TK bindings, uh, a few other flags pretty much. And so you can build your Ruby as you seem fit for your actual use cases. And then further down is a glorified change log from this guy, just updating the spec file for every version of Ruby that comes out effectively. So that's that. And let me cheat real quick. We are going to run this command right here. This says RPM build, go to this spec file and build me a package. Nope, because uh, it did its job and we are missing these dependencies. As listed out in the spec file, we need all this stuff pre-installed to actually compile Ruby. Uh, also me cheating. To say, install the things. Oh good, it does see the internet. I forgot to check that before coming here. <laughs> so we are getting all of the um, build packages that the compile time uh, part of Ruby will actually use to build its stuff. So. And done. So let's try this again. If we did our job right, it should actually start building Ruby. And there it goes. This is what C code looks like when it's building something. Um, it's pretty easy to follow. I mean, right there you have, right there's a blonde, brunette's right there, redhead. I think Waldo is further down when you find him. But this will uh, go on for a little bit. Um, and if it basically doesn't spit out a stack trace or a sake fault or pretty much anything, um, we will have ourselves a nice Ruby package. And so my question for you is we can either watch this for the next two and a half-ish minutes or we can just use the pre-built file I made that would be the RPM for this. Pre-built. Okay, good. We'll let that go. Good call. We'll keep this, I'll keep this open. I'll keep this open. Pre-built. Yeah. Really? There we go. Still going? Yep, still going. Oh, look, you can actually see like building all the some of the base objects that Ruby uses. There's a ZMD5 module, there's the Shaw module. Fun stuff. So, anyway, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, we have a directory called, I made a directory called ready, and there's our file. So, this is the file that would normally spit out in. Um, the RPMs directory in our build directory. So, here we go. And so to do this, we have our package. Imagine SSH or SF, excuse me, SCPing this up to a server, drag and dropping, I don't care how, but let's pretend we're on a server. Our package is there, ready to install it. Uh, we're going to tell Yum, um, don't worry about the uh, PGP check because there is none. Um, you can sign packages if you're so inclined. However, that's out of the scope of this. Also, I don't know how, but I trust my own package. Say go. Oh, actually, let's do this first. 
Yeah, yes, that's it. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this OS has no Ruby, has no gem, has no IRB. We got nothing. So let's actually install it. Hey, found a Ruby. Great. Yes, we want to install it. Hold, please. It's still going. Yep, still going. <laughs> Wait for it. Wait for it. Actually, this might get done before this gets done. Nope, oh, there we go. Yep, that's still going. Okay. And so hopefully, if we did our job right, hey, we got Ruby. We got IRB. Yay, we got Ruby. We're not done yet, though. Because there's a uh, slight problem here. Um, we obviously don't have a Bundler, because Bundler is still a separate gem from Ruby. So we should pro probably install Bundler so we can actually do stuff. Just do that. Ah, I don't have permissions to write to stuff. So what do we do with this? We run sudo. No, we do not run sudo. <laughs> there is no reason to run sudo to install a, th a package from a third party package manager. If anyone paid attention to the latest faux pas from Node.js, running sudo for the latest version of Node at the time pretty much jacked with every system file um, as far as uh, system directories go, and in fact, we've rendered your Linux install worthless. So don't run sudo. That has to be a better array. Well, the reason why we have this, and the reason why you don't have this for um, stuff like uh, RBM and RVM is they are wired be um, to point the gem command to write gems to a separate directory. Uh, because the user installed RVM, RBM, um, that means the user has to have write access to the directory it writes. So that's why you don't need sudo when you use those uh, development tools effectively. System Ruby writes to the, you know, where everything, all the other binaries go with the system. In this case, we default to user lib64 ruby gems 2.4.0, which is owned by root because we installed Ruby as root, and obviously my user can't write to it. So how do we handle that? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's try order back. What we're going to do, and there are a couple ways to handle this. The uh, sledgehammer race way is um, there is a directory called etc profile d. And if anyone's familiar with your bash profile stuff in um, OSX, uh, think of it as a bash profile for every user on the system in this directory. So besides your own personal uh, uh, profile files, extra stuff is also ran, which is provided to all users. Um, I'm going to cheat on this, actually. Bash, oops. Bim, bash, I'll throw in bash RC. Hey, those are my cheat scripts. And what we're going to do is we're going to make um, two environments, but we're going to adjust our path as well as tweak our um, another environment variable called gem home. Commonly, if you put this in a uh, the global Etsy profile D, you substitute this stuff for a variable that says, hey, point to whatever home the user uh, for this particular user, and this allows each user on the system to install gems in their home directory in a nice area where they have full write access. So commonly this would be used for a system where you have a dedicated user to actually run your app. And so that user installs its gems to its home directory, siloed off from all the other users on the system. And so to do this, we uh, the gem command looks for an environment variable, variable called gem home. You saw it earlier defaulted to user lib64. Instead, we're going to say jump in the home directory, uh, make a dot gem directory. Since it's dot, it will be hidden from standard file browsers. And we're just going to shove everything inside of Ruby 2.4.0. We want to separate versions of, uh, of our gems because commonly when you jump um, y, uh, x, uh, x versions or y versions of Ruby, all of your gems aren't 
compatible, so you have to reinstall them anyway. So this provides a nice way of siloing off by version all of your gems. You do, when you do a, a major Ruby upgrade, you can just delete that directory for that version and work on your other version for your gems. So we do that, source that. Why was that 2.4.0 instead of 2.4.3 or whatever? In the uh, because uh, the way that Ruby creates um, um, its versioning, any Z release is guaranteed compatible with all existing gems on your system. Okay. And so it's just, I mean, I could easily just call it 2.4 for that. So let's try installing Bundler again. So all that's set. Yay. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah, and I forgot to tell it not to install my documentation. Oh, well. Done. Now we have Bundler. Yay. Now we're done. So we have Ruby installed, we have Jim installed, we have IRB installed, and we have a uh, the bundler command ready to go. And so effectively, this would be your user that uh, would execute your app on production. And you can wire this up relatively easily with Chef. Uh, w get your RPM from wherever repo you want, install Ruby, set some paths, uh, configure the user, and call it a day pretty much, as opposed to wiring up uh, RBM if you're so inclined, but uh, and yeah, we're done. It, yeah, exit zero. It built it just to prove it. Uh, RPMs. Oops. CD RPMs. We have the x86 arch in here, and then we have here's our Ruby RPM, and here is Ruby with some debugging symbols, and that's mainly for. Um, various other testings. Uh, installing this particular package exposes some extra symbols for uh, testing stuff out as if you're kind of not, it's more advanced stuff pretty much if you want to like poke and prod against your executables. It compiles it with some extra flags effectively. But um, that's more or less it. Um, yeah, here's another cheat sheet. And that's pretty much all I got for this, uh, building your own Ruby. Um, if you're so inclined, the text version of this, I wrote a blog entry about this about a year ago, uh, which I took all this from. Uh, that's the link to it. Um, and a copy of my slides are at this show and tell repo. And uh, that's about it, really. It, sh it should. It, sh uh, it should force you into an upgrade path. Uh, worst comes to worst, um, you can un just uninstall that and then, re and then reinstall the new binary. But the, g the gem rules still apply that you would have to reinstall all your gems. And so you might as well, that's why I kept the gems in separate paths, so you can just change your paths, reinstall your gems. Everything's good, you don't need to roll back, so delete the old gem directory and call it a day. So we, we did a, uh, a wget early to get the source, yeah. but in the, that long file it had the path to the source. Yeah, that is mainly for um, meta information. So uh, yum and apt-get, uh, when you search packages, it can display meta, it's metadata about the package. Okay. This is where the source code came from. It doesn't actually pull it so on install. Could, we could change that configuration file and lie about where we got the code. You could, yes. Okay. Yeah. Welcome to the world of Linux where Admins should trust each other. Cool. Anyone else? Thank you, Tony. <laughs>